Jaldar, Manji Svidvak, Indra Bhattarga, Sumatidyana, Sasana Dara, Samudra, Sri Bhajan Sarasidhi, Hum Hum. Evoking my Guru, the Dalai Lama, the great 14th Dalai Lama, who happily is having new legs, new knees. Okay, so today I think this will be the last of our sessions, I believe. And um, I'm kind of happy and sad. I've enjoyed reading it, actually, and learned, learned a lot about how I would have expanded it if it was a format where I could. And a uh, few improvements, too, for a second edition someday, if I ever do one. So I've really enjoyed it, and I thank you all for having traveled with me, those of you who have. And uh, now we've finished the eight paths, and this effort where I attempted to put all levels of the Buddha teaching, you know, uh, a foundational, intermediate, so to speak, and most advanced, most esoteric, all together, but putting them in the framework of the four friendly fun facts or the four noble truths or the four friendly facts or whatever you want to call them. Uh, I have a reason to call them the friendly facts, actually, in the simplest way. And um, I finished, we finished that because we did the Eightfold Path, which is the fourth friendly fact or noble truth. And the Samadhi one, where you really come down on one point with what you want to, realizing, that is to say, making real what you want to be the case in the world. And this, you know, and lately I've come up with some very radical thing about the three levels of wisdom in traditional Buddhism, where, um, and even in other Indian inner sciences as well as Buddhism, because they use the same words, and pretty much. And um, these are the three kinds of wisdom are wisdom born of hearing, which I believe means really learning, because you didn't have a lot of printed books in those days and you didn't have the internet and iPhones. So you would hear a teaching from someone. They would, they would teach you by, by talking to you. They would tend to memorize it. You would tend to memorize what you heard. But therefore, hearing was like learning. <clears throat> so, wisdom born of, of hearing. Shrutamayi pranya. And then wisdom born of thinking. Chintamayi pranya. And thinking, <clears throat> I believe, <clears throat> actually is more or less what we mean by meditating. In other words, um, what we call meditating it's like the meditations of Descartes, the meditations of, um, of the Stoics, etc. And so meditations are kind of sustained discursive thought, seeking truth or, or um, reflecting on experience or telling memories and things like that. And that's called meditation, really. And then contemplation Maybe it's something a little bit different, but even that is kind of in the era of sort of surveying things. Whereas the word of the third type of, of wisdom, which is bhavana maye, mai, prajna, and bhavana comes from bhava, bu, which means to become, or to be, or to make uh, be, to create something. So bhavana is really Ideally, where the one-pointed meditation has joined with the result of the thinking meditation to sort of impress deeply whatever has been understood. Because you can understand something at different levels. So you meditate on it in the second level, actually. But then the third level, bhavana mayi, which we take as meditation, we do wisdom born of th hearing, wisdom born of thinking, wisdom born of meditating. But we don't actually think of meditating in English as where you actually make something come to be, come to pass. 
the word we really have for that is realize, in a sense that you make it real. And of course, we use realize more in terms of you make a change in your mind and you realize something. But you also realize a project, you realize a plan, meaning you actually execute it, uh, you realize the result. And so bhavana really, and it being a gerund from the bhava, which means something that exists, is a exist, existing or making something exist. So it really is where it's wisdom born of transformation, really, and realization. So I'm dabbling in, in revising translations and new translations in using the word realize much more widely. And then a word which is uh, adigama, which we think of as under, it's kind of like understanding, but that again is different from um, Western ideas because of the authoritarian nature of European societies, and English one, where the language is. Understand, we think is like aha, of what are you standing under? You might be obeying something. It might have to do with accepting authority in some case, I think, a little bit from a dogmatic sort of point of view. Whereas in, in uh, India, when you understand something in the sense of you see the world in a different way, you go into a different world. So they have a word adigama, or it really relates to the word to go rather than a word to stand. So usually, you know, so, but still in English, it does mean where you change your mind in some way. So the word adigama, tokpa, uh, we, we, um, we can use understand there, I think. And meditate, we can use for more thinking. And then we can, we can specify one point in meditating. So anyway, we have gone well then. So sharing my consolation prize is our topic for today, chapter 10, which is the last chapter. And um, what, what is a consolation prize? A consolation prize is something you give to someone who doesn't win the medal, who doesn't get gold or silver or bronze. <laughs> and I think it's very unfair in the swimming and the running in the things that are timed, because people lose the medal by like three hundredth of a second and things like that. You know, more or less the same effort and the same achievement as the one who got the medal. I mean, it's just so tiny, the differential. So I think they should have more, more medals and more medals. They could go to iron. The final one, they could do lead, maybe. <laughs> but they, you know, stopping at bronze is kind of Copper, they don't even have copper. Come on. So anyway, but a consolation prize anyway is for someone who loses. And if there are two people competing or something, then it's the loser. And then you, the main prize is won by the winner. But then when someone doesn't win, they get a consolation. So this consolation prize is something that I awarded myself finally. Uh, for the fact that I'm frustrated that I'm not a Buddha after 60 some years in this lifetime with reasonable intelligence and reasonable effort, a little bit lazy, but reasonable effort. And um, having even been a mendicant for a while, and then although returning to the family life, living in the family life under a slight stress of being somewhat still like a mendicant as a teacher, you know, professor, and a further student. A teacher is always another kind of student. So anyway, after all that effort, I'm still frustrated that I'm not a Buddha. I, I can't say I'm not enlightened, because I am more enlightened than I was for sure, because I was really confused. But uh, I, can't, I don't claim enlightenment in the, in the real sense of like Buddhahood enlightenment. I'm, I think some Buddhists think Buddha means you have a kind of had some amazing peak experience, and after that you're kind of more cool, and you think that's maybe Buddhahood, and then you, you adapt because your culture is the materialist one, you then are not frustrated that you're not clairvoyant, you can't not telepathic, 
You're not like the one in the Matrix movie doing sort of semi-magical things, miraculous things to help others, of course. It would be your only motive, but you have those abilities. And actually, if you ever want to be a spiritual teacher, you basically have to be semi-clairvoyant. In other words, your sense of empathy for your students has to be so strong that you are more or less sure of the accuracy of how you teach them, because you can pretty much, if not completely, inhabit how they feel empathetically. You can sort of infer how they feel. And in France, sort of, you can add to experiencing them by looking at them and body language and subliminal and intuition. And then you can implement that, you can supplement that by, in, by, by inference from things they say and do and how they behave and what they've studied and so on. So you really, to, and as an ordinary teacher, you can feel they've reached a certain level and know you're teaching at the right level in general. But a spiritual teacher to take a person one-on-one -on -one through, uh, coach them through a certain process of their own self-revelation, so to speak, bringing out their own insight and reality, and then for that you really do need clairvoyance. You need abhijna, the abhijna, the sort of super-knowing uh, faculties that uh, five or six are usually listed that you get automatically upon getting close to Buddhahood, at least to seventh, eighth stage of Bodhisattvahood. And uh, I'm frustrated that I'm not, because I know I can't do these things. I, can, I try to, like uh, when my wife was really sick years back, I made so many efforts to sort of osmotic, osmotically, if that's a word, by osmosis, take the sickness away from her, to lighten, at least lighten it, if not take it totally away. And I couldn't. It, it seemed to have no impact, uh, my effort, you know. And that was very frustrating to me. And if someone I know and love got very sick, I'd be very annoyed. My friends, I'm old now and they're dying and I can't necessarily help them particularly. After death, I, I can imagine going in to help them leave the body in a good way, like Poa. I can imagine them meeting with a Buddha or something, once and twice doing a ceremony for a friend. I actually kind of, in my inner vision, I saw them meet up with the Dalai Lama, go through the central channel of the Dalai Lama and get to the Pure Land of Amitabha, the Lotus family, you know, the infinite light Buddha, the Sukhavati Pure Land. I saw one person who was a dear friend who died, and in the ritual, taking care of them, um, translated by Glenn Mullen in one of his nice books, I actually, during the ritual, I was leading the ritual, and I sort of shocked to have like an inner vision of it actually working for the guy, going in his dream body, similar to his previous lived body, and smiling happily going through there. Not because I was doing a ritual, I don't think. He just was doing it, but I actually saw it happen. I was, ama I was amazed, actually. I don't know if the other people, no, nobody else in that ritual told me they also saw that, but they felt good about how he was moving. And when I told them, they were pleased. But, you know, I can't do that regularly, and I don't know if I really did it or I was just imagining it, you know. So that's frustrating to me. So anyway, so I don't want to go on and on about it, but that's my consolation prize. And um, so... I'll read it, and then I'll comment as we go along. The first of the four, that's a little bit summary first. The first of the four friendly facts, or noble truths, was the diagnosis. The Buddha says, if you're not enlightened, that means you don't know what you are, not only who, but what. And you don't know what the world you're in is really about. Therefore, you're going to have a frustrating time because you're going to be wandering like a blind person on the freeway. <laughs> That's not even a genius statement. It's an obvious statement. If you don't know what's going on, you're going to have a hard time. So it, actually, I don't know why I call it the diagnosis. 
because actually it's the recognition, it's the acknowledgement of the symptoms, really, the first noble, first friendly fun fact. So that is part of the diagnosis. You don't, you don't, you don't live in denial of the symptoms. I guess that's part of it, but but more, it's more facing the, facing the illness. Actually, is what it is. I don't know why I wrote diagnosis. I think that was a little bit of a mistake, because the second funny fact is the diagnosis. In other words, why you have the symptoms. That's the second uh, noble truth or funny fact. But the first one that you're going to have a hard time when you don't know what's going on is just a, a it's a friendly fact. A friend points that out to you that you should be very careful and cool and try to figure out what is going on because if you don't if you live where well, you don't know what you are and who you are and what in the world is you're definitely going to run you're going to be unrealistic in your actions your thoughts and you're going to collide with reality it's going to be hard to cope with reality so the first one is realistically to assess because these are facts and they're friendly facts that a friend would point out to you. They're helpful facts in that sense. They're not negative. Even though the first seems negative in that you face the natural frustratedness and imperfection of the world. And to do that, the pleasures that we crave, you have to realize that <clears throat> they're kind of addictive because of our sense of continued craving while we're enjoying, which then makes the enjoyment when it ceases a frustration. So that's called the suffering of change. And then the suffering, we don't have to reason that through that. It's painful and we don't like it. And that's suffering. And then cosmically, the cosmic suffering is just, if we are a point of difference from everything else in the universe, Something about us is one different thing. And we think it's really different, and the universe is really different. So it's kind of an absolute difference. And once that's the case, relating to the world is immensely problematic. The world must have many negative things in it that we perceive at least as negative, and therefore we are likely to be overwhelmed by them because it's so much bigger than we are. So. Uh, it's kind of obvious, actually. It's a cosmic one. It's when you're not necessarily having any kind of short-term pleasures or any kind of short-term suffering. And so you're kind of in a neutral state. And yet the cosmic state that you're in, of you versus the universe, even you're in a heaven, even you're a god, even you're formless and it seems like nothing can touch you, you still are one versus it all one versus infinity, which you you got to lose. It's very simple. Although he said it's a fact for a noble, truly friendly person, he had a special definition of noble. Noble means someone who has a degree of altruistic perception, not just a moralistic attitude about altruism, but actually sees things equally from others' perspectives as their own takes their, the other's perspectives into account naturally, automatically, just as they take their own perspective as sort, of, as sort of first perspective, and who therefore perceives the life pulse of others as equal to their own in importance and in reality, and who therefore is truly friendly with other beings, because wishing them well, naturally because one feels one is them. The second truth stems from the fact that, I'm just summarizing because we've discussed that in great detail earlier in, the, in these sessions. The second truth stems from the fact that most people are not going to agree that ordinary life is suffering. They have moments of relief. They have moments of pleasure and pain. It's not all suffering. So they won't agree with that. So it's not a fact for them. So Buddha knew that is the point. So Buddha knew by saying that's a noble fact and you have to try to acknowledge it, knew that doing that was a kind of analytic effort. It was an educational effort a person would have to make. They would have to go to their pleasures. They would have to go to their uh, sufferings they don't have to go to. But they have to notice 
their, in their frustration at the loss of them, their dissatisfaction when they're not as good as they want them to be and so on. And notice that they're never quite happy with them because they change. They're not what they expect and so on. Now the second truth is that there's a cause of that suffering, which is unenlightenment. What's the cause? The cause is self-centeredness, I remember, but that's part of unenlightenment. So that's, that's a key component of it. Not that people are immoral by nature. This is not like original sin. It isn't that. They can be quite moral by following rules. It's that the unenlightened person thinks I'm the one, like Neo in the Matrix. In other words, they think they're the most important. They think they're the center of things. They think that's natural and normal and inevitable, even, that they are the center of things. Uh, they do. We do, actually, I should say. And, uh, and yet, uh, when they have more experience, when they get to know other people, maybe fall in love with someone, or maybe have... Um, child experience, I have a baby or something, uh, then they realize, wow, that life is just as much of a life as my life. And so everyone has a fact, some element of altruism, except uh, even total psychotic people still do. Because you can't be, it's impossible to be totally psychotic unless you become a real yogi of psychosis, which that, that is possible, actually. Many of us here might be thinking that, each person is the main person in their own life, right? Don't we think that? At least we think we're supposed to look out for number one, be responsible, whatever. We make ourselves separate from others, and we crave for things to be a certain way. And this separates us further into an unrealistic state of alienation, because we quickly notice that other people don't normally think or agree that we are the one. They think they're the one, actually. Except maybe mom or dad, briefly, when we were in a childhood honeymoon, infant honeymoon, or maybe, perhaps temporarily, someone who is in love with us. Then they think we're the one, maybe. So that's why people like being beloved, because at least the people seem to act like they think that you, they agree with you that you're the one. <laughs> And that's why loving couples drive everybody else completely wacky, because temporarily they each think the other one is the one, and then, at least as far as, as long as the honeymoon goes, and then the other people feel really left out, and they really feel freaked out. So that's why they kill off Romeo and Juliet always, very often. I mean, it's a common trope, right, isn't it? The Buddha gave a very helpful and very surprising prognosis. So that's the diagnosis. The so second one about the cause causal process and the cause being, central cause being a kind of epistemological or cognitive self centeredness, like somehow my knowing seems to come from within the center of me. So therefore, I assume there's like the ultimate, you know, hard disk is my self, you know, it's my cognition, it's my consciousness. That's the hard disk that registers all my experience for five senses and then mental sense of my thought and imaginations and things. So I, I, don't, I don't often look back to try to find that, or if I do, I have a hard time doing it with that. But then even then, I think it's myself looking for myself. And I think there's still a center around that, my world. And that is an error, according to Buddha. It's not a sin, but it's a mistake because it brings me into a confrontation with something much more powerful and much bigger than me in a conflict, actually, with it, ultimately. Temporarily, it might be a cooperation if, you know, in some state, but then when the Titanic hits the iceberg, then it's who gets in the lifeboat, you know. Every, everybody sat for, for himself, as one bodhisattva friend of mine used to say. <laughs> Uh, not a little bit ominously, I must say. So then we come to the third one. Then the Buddha gave a very hopeful and very surprising prognosis, like a doctor's prognosis about your illness, and this is why you have it, and now this is how I think you can 
recover, or a bad prognosis is, I'm sorry, you're, you've had it, you can't recover. There's nothing we can do for you, nothing you can do for yourself. And that's the third noble truth, and that's the really most fun fact. Nobody believes it, but nobody believes that either. So that's what uh, uh, Buddha says about that. Realize it. So nirvana, the freedom from suffering. Nobody believes that it's possible to be free from suffering. That's when I say nobody believes it. But Buddha says, and Buddha knows that you don't believe that, when he says that as a friendly, friendly fact. But he says you must realize that. You should try to realize it, he says. And, and the way you begin to realize something is you imagine it first. So that's, he kind of gives that instruction. He do, it doesn't help that much to believe in it. it. It helps maybe a little at some point, if you've had some experiential hints. But, it, but, you, have, but you have to imagine it. And that takes effort, analytic effort, meditative effort at the second level of wisdom. The realizing will be when you attain it. That's when you go to the full level. You completely, in a way, you open your mind where the universe, everything becomes the center of the universe. And you become that center of every, that everything center. Actually, Emerson made a beautiful, the, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the famous teacher of the first half of the 19th century, <clears throat> who was a Harvard graduate and gave one lecture at Harvard Divinity School and was never invited again <laughs> because he said that what you have to be is like an eye, E-Y-E, eye, that sees in the middle of nature, that sees in all directions at once. So in other words, it doesn't have a kind of specific perspective from an from a alienated center. It is, it's, it's there, but it's open to every kind of perspective, seeing, it, seeing everywhere at once. And he said that's what Jesus was, and that everybody should be like that. So then at the divinity school, they kicked him out, because they don't want to have to try to imitate Jesus. Even though there was a great English mystic book called Imitatio Christi, written by Thomas Akempis in England in 15th or 16th century, called Imitatio Christi, which is more like what Emerson taught. I don't know if you had read that book. But that's, that's the open-mindedness, open vision. And vision is like what we think of as our mind, because we're used to thinking that when we're seeing things, we're awake. And when we're not, we're not awake. We're not conscious. So seeing is very much central to our consciousness. So, and this is very important, why I don't like calling them the noble truths, and probably why the earlier translations did call them that, and therefore all Buddhists think that's absolutely what satya is. But you see, the thing about a truth is, and it does also hold for the Indian word satya, which, is, which can be translated not incorrectly as truth, but what's a bad connotation about calling it a truth rather than a fact, is that this is the use of truth about reality. Something's true means it's real. But a proposition can be true, like a statement, a verbal, there's a verbal level of truth, which is we very much associate with the word truth, where you, a statement about reality is either true or false. And so, but this fact is, is reality, and its opposite is unreality a hallucination or a mirage or something that is unreal, right? So it's not a matter of believing a fact. It's a matter of knowing a fact, you know, or disagreeing and knowing the unfactuality of a fact, one or the other, you know. So it's within the, it was in the realm of of a verifiable binary linguistic cognition, you could say. You know. So it's the prognosis that you can be free of suffering, really free of suffering, not just enjoying temporary relief 
a bit of pleasure that won't last from some external event or some success or the acquisition of something or a nice relationship. But that just, but that just from within, from knowing your own true nature, you can have a perfect freedom from suffering. Because your real nature is this nirvana, this freedom from suffering. Your real nature is harmonious, completely attuned interaction with the universe and interconnection with the universe in such a way that it is blissful, like a loving interconnection. But that just, so, so what they don't believe is that just from within, from knowing your own true nature, you can have perfect freedom from suffering. That's what people don't believe. Buddha taught that and he manifested it himself. And many people realized it in his own time, and I must say in his own presence, in his field. You know, they have a, actually Buddhists feel that we are even as ordinary and unenlightened beings, we are bigger than what's inside our skin. That our mind, the fields of our mind, like our visual field, the objects in our visual field are part of our body, they believe. And that's why two people, are, people, different people are always overlapping because they see a lot of the same things, although everyone sees from some unique perspective of their own. No, no two people see the same thing the same way exactly, although they might name it the same or describe it the same. But everybody sees it with a slightly different vision. That's very important to realize. Buddha taught that, and he manifested it himself. And many people realize it in his own time and in his own presence. Subsequently, many people have realized that, and probably some of you have realized it, who are reading this book, I'm saying, or listening to me. The prognosis is very, very good. You're taught in our somewhat constricted culture and somewhat militaristic society, coming from a Euro-American colonialist past, that you're hard, you are hardwired and there's nothing you can do about it. The way the Buddhist inner scientist understands you, understands your humanity, however, is that you are not very hardwired at all. The Buddhist view is that the human being is completely malleable in their wiring. Any human being can become a saint and very easygoing. And any human being can become quite evil and very, very difficult if they go on the dark, go to the dark side and all degrees in between. Actually, every human being is continually changing all the time. If you don't become more conscious about how you change and what changes things and what influences you, and you do not choose what you allow to influence you by using your intelligent discrimination, you will probably be changed for the worse. This is why we have the fourth truth, a noble truth or friendly truth or friendly fact, and that's the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is like a whole curriculum of a university. It should be the core curriculum of all our liberal educating universities, 100%. The first path asks this Eightfold Path, there's eight of these paths. They crisscross with each other. They parallel each other. And they, finally, one has to get where one can move on all of them simultaneously. You can't really finish one without doing the others. It's a weird kind of highway, freeway. The first path asks, what is real versus what is unreal? This is what we refer to as realistic worldview. Are you just a brain being referred to as a realistic world? No, I'm sorry, are you just a brain being carried around on top of a skeleton in between Halloweens? <laughs> rattling around in there, hopefully producing a lot of dopamine to make you feel better without any malevolent drugs. Hopefully, that's what you are. But are you that? Are you merely a brain? Is your life really meaningless? Absolutely, ultimately. 
Does nobody really care about it? Should you therefore, realistically speaking, not really care about it yourself, except for what you can get out of this or that pleasure? Do you have a purpose? How happy can you be? Even that's open to question. I think most people don't think they can really be that happy. They feel wisdom is a kind of resignation to carrying out your misery with nobility. Just stagger around and have the occasional glass of wine. From the idea of nirvana that you can be perfectly happy, sure, give me a break. Nirvana's an Indian restaurant. <laughs> That's why Buddha was so smart. For less capable people, he was careful not to really say nirvana is bliss. He would say that nirvana is freedom from suffering. It's, a, it's the end of suffering. He didn't really say bliss that much now and then, but not all the time. He just said end of suffering and let people think about what that might be. Probably knowing that the more psycho types among them uh, would just think it was an annihilation and anesthesia, you know. That was more sensible to them. They would be less skeptical about that. Your realistic worldview is that you're here forever and you have to be concerned not just with your old age and your pension, you have to be concerned with your next life. The way to be concerned for your next life is to invest now in your mind and get your mind open and clear. That's the first thing. Once you have that realistic worldview, you realize you are a precious continuum of good energy, still dragging along behind you some bad energy. And your job as a human is to take this unique opportunity to really increase the good exponentially and really decrease the bad just as exponentially. Then you have the realistic motivation. So from that kind of overview, that will develop in you a realistic motivation. Sometimes people like to translate it as intention. I like motivation. So, rea so realistic motivation, once you have adopted comprehend compassionate commitment to causality. So I'm saying, so, so, so as for realistic motivation, once you have adopted compassionate commitment to causality, then your motivation is to associate yourself with all good causes and reduce connection to negative causes. You are an evolving being. And you should develop the motivation to use your time of being conscious so that you're motivated to always choose the positive, even if it's the tiniest little thing. And your motivation is to always choose the slight increment that's better as opposed to the increment that's worse. Then, from realistic motivation, they, so then you choose a life purpose, which is, of course, to achieve freedom from suffering. You really... And, and this is, you know, there's a, in Western ethics and Western philosophy, hedonism is considered a bad thing, except for hedonists. They, they don't think, agree, <laughs> like Epicurus and people like that. But otherwise it is, because in a way they know that that kind of self-centered pleasure, egotistically sought and experienced pleasure, will never be enough. And therefore, that person will be frustrated, and it is not a realistic way of motivation for life. On the other hand, a motivation to achieve complete happiness, not temporary pleasures but only, but complete happiness, and moreover, to do it in such a way that you can help others find complete happiness, that is totally worthwhile. It may incorporate some aspect of hedonism in that, Realistically speaking, it notices that human beings like to be happy. Every animal does. No animal wants pain. Our great Western scientists only in the last few decades have finally gotten around 
to agreeing with not only all the Hindus and Buddhists and Taoists and all kinds of other people in the universe, but even their dear Albert Schweitzer, who insisted that animals have souls, that animals have sensation, that they feel pain and grief and so on, and therefore they can't just be treated like so many dinners or, or you know, shoe leather or whatever, you know. They really can't. So anyway, that realistic motivation is clear once you have a realistic worldview. Next, you have what's called realistic evolutionary action. Realistic, which means karma. Karma doesn't just mean any act. It means an evolutionary act. An act you do with a certain intention. Because your mind is involved, it will change the shape of your life. What you do changes the way you are, and not just what you do physically. What you do verbally and what you do mentally will also change the mode of your life. You want to do only that which will change your life and your mind for the better. What you discover with realistic evolutionary action is that the mind causes change, and therefore you have to gain leverage over your mind. You might think, Somebody was mean to me, and then you brood and brood, and then you can't get out of that cycle of brooding, which will lead to being depressed and freaked out. Indeed, you feel there is a part of your mind that is brooding, and you tell it, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. They were unpleasant yesterday, but forget them. I'm going to have a happy time today. I'm going to do something else. You can switch. As I said before, it's like you get a clicker for your mind. Otherwise, you have to follow everywhere your mind leads you. You're just a victim of thoughts that are put in there by conditioning that you have no control over. So you're just a victim of your environment and you don't have any freedom in your mind. When your mind tells you, oh, he said that to me, I have to get freaked out. Can you instead sit back and say something else? Why should I do that? What good is that going to do? That's not going to help. Your more intelligent mind comes and intervenes, and you have a dialogue inside yourself. That's not a sign of dementia. That's a sign of waking up. It's called mindfulness practice. Then there, and then so that we skipped to so realistic speech was uh, very important. We, we did that very quickly. I just mentioned what is good speech against what is bad speech, but I didn't go very lengthily into the power of speech because speech is so powerful because actually all of us, that is our root, our anchor to altruism. Up to, that's why the human among animals accelerates altruism so much. Language involves empathy with others. It involves the need to cooperate with them the need to enlist their understanding of what you understand and to find out what they understand to correct what you misunderstand. And so you do move outside of your self-centeredness through language. It is absolutely the link, the linker upper between self and other is language. And, um, you know, language, therefore poetry is so powerful because it kind of takes you out of yourself. The poet has to get out of himself to find the poem, which would which sort of gives people, lifts them into a new perspective. And to be, appreciate the poem, you have to be willing to leave your own ang angle for at least a split second and, and, and see the, enter the world of the poem. So then there's realistic, then, then there is actually realistic mindfulness. Oh, I, oh, I'm skipped, I skipped too much. I ever heard, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A sign of waking up. Then there's realistic livelihood. You're still in realistic evolutionary action. After speech, evolutionary action, you have realistic livelihood. Number five, you shouldn't, have a pro you shouldn't have a profession where you're doing something harmful to anybody. Like, in a way, you really shouldn't be a military person. And, of course, there is a reason to be where there are other people are being, in the sense of you could do it to protect other people. You could do that. 
But otherwise, in an ideal world, there would be no harm, harming profession, in other words. You should, because you, you, and you would assume others would not want to, so you don't have to, sort of thing. That, that's a world of peace. You should only have a life, you know, I used to define peace. The true world of peace, the, 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 as only Salah Lama says, world peace through inner peace, with which I utterly agree. And uh, I used to say that when people would risk their lives not to take another life, another's life, not to harm another, they would harm themselves, they put themselves in the way of harm, to avoid harming another. That's a place where you can't have war, where you will begin to have peace. When people demand to be left at peace and they insist on t taking any problems upon themselves and to solve them without ever using violence, then, th then that'll be a world of peace. You should, yeah. You should only have a livelihood that benefits people because you get an evolutionary impact from that benefit. That's very important. The pro professions of weapons makers, butchers, alcohol distributors, and addiction drug pushers of various kinds, addictive drug pushers of various kinds, are all strongly disrecommended. You can figure that out for yourself. That's a realistic livelihood. Bad to be a liquor salesman, for example. Then six is realistic creativity. This is where you get out of your laziness. You become really creative when you realize that you have to be, do something about your life in your mind so that no one else can do it for you. I, I have that, I love that about Buddha. Buddha like, says like, oh wow, I'm enlightened, it's so cool. And now I'm happy because I see you can become enlightened. But I can't make you enlightened. You have to be, understand this on your own, or on your own state. You have to understand your own state. You can do that, I see that. But you have to do it yourself. I can't understand yourself for you. You have to understand yourself. Faith alone will not make you enlightened. Un understanding makes you enlightened. And you even have to lay off self-centered understanding. You have to lay that off. That's why Buddha's big job was to found a school, really, not a religion, but a school. It's not just a school to enable you to have a, a profession and produce things. It's a school to make you evolve. You produce yourself in a future world, and you are able to do things for other beings and produce their happiness by being a loving being in both this and the future world. That's what it takes. That's what it's about, to really be competently a loving being. That's quite a task. And that's what you become when you become enlightened. You become a really loving being. You'll never lose your temper and so on. Then there's realistic mindfulness. You know, that's, you remember those uh, speech, evolutionary action, and livelihood are pretty much in the ethics level. And then in the meditative level is the next one. So that's a, there should be a break there. After you say that, then there's realistic mindfulness. After creativity, mindfulness. Mindfulness really means becoming self-aware in a different way. It doesn't put just mean when you're meditating. Uh, when you're meditating, it also means to be more self-conscious of yourself when you're interacting with people. The groundwork of it is counting one to ten counting your breath, looking, looking there at yourself. The real groundwork is to become aware, to observe how your mind, body, in, in, inside, how your mind works inside, and how your thoughts link together. And you find the gaps in those links and learn to interfere with the ones that are going in the wrong direction and to empower the ones that are going in the right direction. 
At first, you just want to see what's happening. That's realistic mindfulness. Finally, the last of them all is the true meditation one, which is realistic samadhi. This is the one where really, realistic samadhi is the one where true meditation becomes realization. A concentrated, one-pointed meditation. In other words, you shouldn't do heavy meditation, really, in bro. Shutting your mind into one point until you know which point to shut it down on. If you take your ignorance and become concentrated on it one-pointedly, you will become more magnificently ignorant. <laughs> That's really very important. So there's a lot to learn first. As I mentioned, Buddhism is like a school and it has many courses. They're open to all to take. You don't have to be Buddhist and you don't have to become Buddhist either. You'll be, an, you'll be a better Christian or Jew or secularist or Muslim, whatever you will, if you study from those courses. Of course, Buddhists should study other courses. The Dalai Lama always sends his monks off to Christian monasteries and converts to study how these monks, these monks and men Monks and nuns do this, this and that. He particularly likes the Catholic nuns who run hospitals and do other good works. He thinks the Buddhists don't do enough of that, and he likes them doing it very much. So that's the Eightfold Path, and that was Buddha's basic therapy. It was Buddha's basic force for good. What you see the Dalai Lama doing is not promoting Buddhism. He may do that for Buddhists. But for others, he's not promoting any such thing. He's trying to change the education system of the world to bring more compassion and love into people's minds as part of their education. And of course, the root of compassion is realistic wisdom, knowing what reality is. The more you know what reality is, the more you know you really do depend on others. And then you know the quality of your life depends to a large degree on your relationships with others. Therefore, you will find the resources for, for the inner bliss that enables you to be more loving and compassionate to others, and then you'll be happy. Okay, so that was a kind of summary. And now just a few more as the actual consolation prize. Sharing my consolation prize. Anyway, I'm not reached all of that Eightfold Path. I'm not claiming that. However, this is what I want to say. Some, nowadays, when I share some teachings with students, the question does come up, I guess at the beginning as well as at the end, where do I myself stand? Am I, quote, enlightened, unquote, myself? And speaking from, quote, there, as I tell them about all these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, about the infinite lifestyle, bliss, Buddhahood, the positive, glorious, exquisite nature of reality, or am I just doing wishful thinking, rationalization, living in fantasy land? I always honestly answer, no, I am not enlightened. I am just like you, looking for it, hoping for it. I sometimes say jokingly to lighten things up, actually, I want to reassure you that I'm actually quite miserable. Just as, in, just as honorably miserable as many of you may be, though I hope a bit less after our conversation these days. <laughs> There's often a sigh of disappointment when I speak like this in one way, and maybe a feeling of relief in another, that we're all the same and there's no point working too hard to change. My wife scolded me recently about how I always intensively deny how I'm enlightened, which I do, especially around the house, or I'm in real trouble actually, because I don't act enlightened all the time. She said, yeah, that's correct. You're an idiot. But in a way, you are more enlightened than most people. So it would discourage them too much if you keep insisting on how unenlightened you are. So shut up and admit, it to, a, admit to a bit of enlightenment. <laughs> of course, I am not a Buddha. Probably if she was here, I, she would say, no, I, was, I didn't really say it like that. She would change it. Of course, I am not a Buddha, since I cannot hold my mind on a dot of blue color for two hours without wavering. 
I cannot levitate. I cannot wakingly emerge in a subtle body out of my coarse, ordinary body. I can only do it in a dream. I cannot fly through the air. I cannot live in a 20 below mountain winter stark naked like Milarepa. I cannot conjure jewel trees out of toothpicks, radiant, radiate light rays from my forehead. I cannot talk to the gods, ward off demons, heal my friends, calm my enemies. I cannot liberate Tibet and all prisoners of conscience and all victims of famine, genocide, war and disease and bad dictators and leaders all over the world. I cannot find souls in the between states and move them into Buddha verses. I cannot even be sure my teachings have any positive effect on my students. I definitely believe that Buddhas and advanced Bodhisattvas can do such things. But after more than a half a century of study and practice, I have failed at any of the above attainments. And I must admit, I am still a tiny bit unsure whether my belief in them is correct or mistaken. I did, however, succeed in awarding myself a consolation prize to console me in my failure. It came to me one day when I was looking at some family photos in a scrapbook. I came upon a picture of myself and my beloved wife, partner, and teacher, Nina, with our first two children on the beach in the island of Mallorca when we were 29 years old. It was a sunny bit, little bit of paradise immensely enjoyable to see as a pick and to remember. But then my enjoyment was disturbed when I looked at my own face in the few pictures where I'm not taking the picture and in a flash recognized the thought in my mind at the time, which was a strong sense of anxiety in the midst of the blissful scene. Where's, the, where's my wallet? Where's my credit cards? Are we almost out of money? Where's my visa for India, where a fellowship, my fellowship is waiting? Are the kids okay? Is Nina happy? What do we need? Etc. I could see from the picture that I was not in the moment, realistically aware of the blessed fortune, blessed, blissful setting and companionship and peaceful situation on a planet where many beings were suffering, dying, starving, feeling sick, in agony, terrified, tortured, and so on. But then I realized that I now could see how wonderful the situation was, how lucky we were, how blissful and blessed with fortune. I enjoyed the scene immensely, even blissfully, retroactively in that way. I then realized something about the nirvana reality that Buddha discovered and proclaimed to our world in this era. This nirvana reality is not a created state, not a new place created by causes, by effort. It is the ultimate, the, oh, the ultimate for, form of, quote, oh, I knew that all along. How come I didn't recognize it before now? It has obviously always been that way, end quote. If nirvana is there at all, it has to have always been there or here from beginningless time. And when it is experienced as the reality home it has always been, all of one's past experience are re-experienced as having never been apart from that nirvana. I suddenly then realized how it was that the Buddha could experience all his infinite previous lifetimes just at the brink, because in the way the t t teaching is told, uh, the, the brink, the event horizon of realizing the beginningless eternal reality of nirvana, or perpetual would be better, reality of nirvana. In other words, they say that just before he realized the termination of contaminants, which was how they describe enlightenment, he got rid of all contaminated, toxic, all toxicity of his being. So then his natural nirvanic being was evident to him. And then he saw that he had never had any toxic elements, and he'd always had that. So therefore he could remember every detail of everything, because the reason we forget our previous memories is we forget our suffering. We want to forget it. It protects us because we feel so overwhelmed by reality 
We can't bear to remember all the many things we suffered in many previous lives. But when we realize that even in a previous life where we were being devoured, we were a wildebeest being devoured by a lion and her cubs and her lazy husband on the, on the, in, the, in the veldt, in the rift valley, we were ourselves already perfectly left the body and we were blissfully in the barda. And even in the body, we somehow, you know, there was, the pain was lessened, you know, by our, our sort of giving up the stress of seeking grass to eat all the time and running around following the herd and everything. So it wasn't that bad, actually. In fact, there was a core of bliss in our life, which was our life force. And our life force went on out of that body. And when we remember it that way, we realize the peripherality of the munging on our thigh bone. You know? <laughs> Believe it or not, we did. Because after all, the, the, the lions and the cubs, how happy they were. Uh, Buddha had not forgotten so many of those lives because he had experienced them as suffering, as painful. And who wants to remember pain? No one wants to feel pain. And after having done so, no one wants to remember having felt it. But if you realize that you have always really been in nirvana, then you see your past painful experiences as illusory reflections in the bliss-polished mirror surface of unwavering bliss. Now this, of course, is contradictory to us. This is a, this is a paradox. It's a, cogn it's a double bind, because we associate pleasure with the opposite of pain. And uh, we can't imagine a pleasure that is so powerful that pain would be, would, even though we would still be sensitive to it, because we had to be sensitive to have that powerful pleasure, that, but we would, it would be irrelevant. It would be virtually not a pain, because it would be overridden so powerfully by the intensity of exponential bliss. We cannot imagine that. But on the other hand, and this is where we have to resort to earlier I read that I believe Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are like that. So that belief of mine is not a blind belief in a way, although let's not be dogmatic. There may be a quality of blindness in it in any kind of belief that agreed, because a belief sort of picks one option out of two and then therefore is not aware of the complete picture. But it's almost not blind in the following way. Given the frame of reference of infinity, of emptiness, of freedom. Anything is possible. There's no limit. We don't actually live in four-dimensional space-time. We live in six-dimensional space-time. Because space we consider three-dimensional, X, Y, Z. But time is also three-dimensional, past, present, and future. And in fact, both of them are only in our mind. They are concepts. So the point is that given emptiness, that reality is always beyond our concepts. That means there is infinite possibility, infinite future, as well as infinite space. There's perpetual future, let's say, as well as, and beginningless past, as well as infinite space. Given that anything is possible, therefore, that beings who have been here beginninglessly, other than me, I cannot exclude that they could have accomplished what I wish to accomplish. What you can logically describe as the optimal way of being in a relative world, which is where every relationship is 100% positive. There's nothing not positive about it. And, and the positivity, the blissfulness that, that such a being feels is so powerful because anything in it that's negative is immediately overridden by that bliss. Even though the, the nature of being is stuck in suffering is that they think they're only in a present. 
that is only suffering. Whereas I easily see their future, freedom from that. And I easily see their super subtle level, the not quantum foam, but the blissom foam, the blissful foam, the foam of bliss that they're made of. And they're, they're, they, by being confused, they have distorted that foam into a pain. And they are focused only on that pain, even though it, the pain itself is two pieces of bliss being squashed together in some confused manner. But I should see both sides simultaneously if I'm a Buddha. And therefore, I can see their healed the future in their present. And therefore, that, that's why they like to be with Buddhas. That's why people like to hang out with enlightened beings, even to any degree toward that. Because it creates a field where the bright side is sort of pops up. The half-fullness becomes evident, becomes manifest, or not the half-emptiness. Because full emptiness makes for full fullness. It allows full fullness. So, but the point is, what I, what I was trying to get at, though, is that by going to where our language has only opposites because of its binariness, we then get two opposites and we open them through negation of freedom. And then we realize that, that and, and then that negation becomes faith because it cannot exclude a possibility. And that's a little scary, of course, because if, if anything is possible, then extreme suffering is possible. And that's what you could say is hell. If the supreme way of being of utter bliss and utter love and utter wisdom is possible, then utter suffering is also possible. However, also possible about utter suffering is that it won't last. Whereas utter bliss does last, we are assured. And therefore, we, it makes sense to us to, we're almost driven by the fact of the openness to any possibility, relying on the words. Then speech again becomes really important. Relying on the testimony, relying on the intuitive testimony if they don't speak relying on open our mind to the vision of the being that is open to relieve us of the experience of hell which even when you open your mind that way you become open to that possibility because that anything is possible means hell is possible so it's biru bishanam that's why Nakajuna said that the ultimate non-dual reality is emptiness in the womb of compassion. And, but he also said it was biru bishanam. It was terrifying to the fearful or to the anxious or to the timid. Biru, biru bishanam. So that's the kind of clear faith it's called. They have a definition of blind faith. Blind faith is believing something that you simultaneously know not to be the case. So, so to be really blind, you would have to know there is no Buddha. You would have to know there is no hell. That would be to be really blind. Because you know that given infinite time and space, anything goes. No, no possibility can be excluded. <laughs> and, but you, and you need faith in that time because someone who has achieved that ultimate positivity, Buddhahood, has assured the world, has assured you, that they, they do, do not tolerate hell, that they can override hell, actually. That bliss, exponential bliss overrides hell. 
Because apparently, the relief of a being that is convinced they have ultimate suffering is so huge, it explodes that being straight to the Buddha land when you open the door. There's a wonderful thing in the, in the jewel case or jewel sack, sack of jewels sutra, Karanda Vyuha Sutra, sack of jewels array sutra, which is the sutra of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddhist Jesus, the sort of all compassion of all Buddhas, the incarnation of all compassion. And in that, Buddha is, that begins, at the sutra, Buddha is in a grove somewhere with uh, hundreds of followers, you know, his, his disciples and friends and students and so on. And, uh, mo- and then monks and nuns and lay people visiting and so on. And suddenly there's a golden light that comes from his forehead, I think. As I, I forget where it comes from, or maybe it just showers from the sky. I think it comes from his head. And, uh, and then it completely suffuses the whole scene and all the whole assembly. And also there's all kind of, whenever Buddha's anywhere, there's also angels and demons and gods and spirits and all kinds of creatures, invisible creatures, attending. And they're all suffused with this golden light. And then the light diminishes after a minute, after a while. It doesn't really say how long. And it sort of circles around, and then it comes back, and then it goes into the Buddha's foot, I think. Or maybe vice versa. Maybe it comes from the foot and goes in the head. I can't remember. I'm sorry. That's terrible. Never mind. And then another one I'll come. I'll read the current of you, which I'll tell you. And then they say to Buddha, Oh, Buddha, oh, Shakyamuni, sir, uh, Lucky, lucky one, blessed one. Why was, what, what does that golden light mean? What is it? And then Buddha says, oh, that means that Avalokiteshvara is coming. Avalokiteshvara is coming to see us. Aren't we lucky? He says. So you're all going to get a visit from, we're all get a visit from Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> and sure enough, Avalokiteshvara shows up. And then Buddha says purposefully to him, Hey, Lokeshvara, the worrisome god, where you been? Nice to see you, where you been? And then he says, oh, I was just down in hell. And all those creatures were being boiled like peas in a cauldron, like boiling with the bubbling, boiling water and circulating around in the boiling heat. And, the, and, the, and, their, and their subtle energy bodies were completely frying and boiling and bursting and popping, and yet they were endure, they were continuing in it. It wasn't, they weren't having shock system, and there was nothing happening. So I, I couldn't take it, seeing it. So tears flowed from my eyes, my many thousand eyes my sensitivities, and those tears flooded the flames underneath the cold, giant cauldron and distinguished the fire, and they cooled down those beings. And then there, there were, the cooks were there, some devils were running around, and they were very upset, and they ran to Yama, the head devil, the god, the judge, the lord of the dead, and they said, Yama, some character showed up here and just doused the fire when we were cooking the people who were assigned to be cooked by us. What is this? And said, oh, that's got to be Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll have more customers later. <laughs> and let's forget about that particular batch. And then Avalokiteshvara took them and brought them up to the pure land of the Buddha of Infinite Light. He said he enfolded all those poor souls in a tractor beam and he put them in the land of bliss, you know, Sukhavati. But they say that, you know, to make it less unbelievable, 
in the Sutra of Sukhavati, they say that those beings who are brought by compassion of bodhisattvas up a rainbow through a rainbow force field, those beings are kept in a closed blossom lotus because they're born in lotuses to be in a new body in that thing, in that land. But their blossom, their blossom is closed, so they can't see the beauties and the glories of, the, of that universe for some time because they're too frazzled. They need... They will be happy to show them right away, but they're too, they're too like raw, you know. So they have to be nurtured in a closed uh, womb of a lotus for a long period of time. But that's in a different sutra. He doesn't mention it. Just as I brought them out and I put them up there, and then I came to see you because I thought it'd be nice. Oh, how nice says Buddha. That's really nice. That that reminds me of dealing with that issue of the fact that when anything is possible, anything, anything negative is also possible. But the negative is always less powerful than the positive is. The assurance we have from the fully enlightened beings, albeit they are not omnipotent, but they are omniscient. And so, I mean... How could he do that? They had such terrible karma, but in a way it was their own doing. In a way, no, there is no karma. It's all emptiness in a way. It's all freedom. They, the karma, the, the ignorance has to reinforce the, the actions that then get them more and more alienated and isolated and they come to a state of extreme isolation, which could mean boiling, freezing, being cut to pieces or being crushed to pieces. Those are, the, those are the four major kinds of hells. The crushing, cutting, boiling, and freezing. And then many degrees of that. And a horrendous sort of thing. Really horrendous. And uh, actually there's a famous thing in the Buddhist uh, Vinaya of the monks. Of some monks who he expelled from the order. Uh, because a group of them had were so focused on hell and they were meditating in huge detail the extreme suffering possibilities of hell the vision and there's a huge literature of it also there are descriptions that are imagination wrenching and they had overdone that and they became so crazed by doing that they actually hired some uh, thugs to sneak up on them one by one and murder them, <laughs> somehow hoping that nihility, that nothingness would assuage their fear and make it impossible for them to go to those hells that they were over-visualizing. And, they were, and a few of them had been killed which when it came to the Buddha's notice. And the others he expelled from the order, actually. And, he, and that ended up with one of the precepts of you cannot focus on the suffering of the hells too much. You have to balance it with the meditations on compassion, meditations on the, the form realm heavens, of the Brahma bodied heavens, of the, of the pleasure, even ple by the monks, not the pleasure heavens, but other kinds of positive things, in other words. They made an edict like that. Because the Buddha never gave a set of rules just off, like reeled them off of his head. He only set up rules that were based on situations. He would make a judgment and that would become a precedent. So it's a kind of situational legal system, the vow system of the mendicants. On purpose, and he explained that. Why? Because in other situations they are different. And in the future you may need to modify this and that, although certain things cannot be modified completely. But then he did modify them some, somewhat. So, you know, he remained ever anti-dogmatic. So, where was that? Oh, but then I realized I could now see, now I could see how wonderful the situation was, how lucky we were, how blissful and blessed. Oh, yeah, that was in the, in the, in the scrapbook, yeah. Inconceivable bliss. Where, where was it? Freedom from any pain. They are not 100% non-existent, 
They were experienced as painful due to your failure to know their deeper nibbanic reality of inconceivable graceful bliss. Uh, in the real meaning of graceful, you know, blessed. And since you then can see without diminishing the presence of such overwhelming super bliss throughout all your limitless, infinite previous lives, you can also see your beginningless and endless entanglement with the infinite past of all the countless other beings without exception, all of whom, unbeknownst to too many of them, have also never been apart from the uncreated inconceivable bliss of nirvana. And this also explains how a Buddha can attain Buddhahood. Otherwise, because you have Bodhisattva vow, you can't attain fr complete freedom from suffering yourself until everyone has. So the point is, you see that they really are free from it. You see right through the suffering. Or rather, you see the power of bliss being so huge that it trivializes, it, it exponentially overwhelms the, suffer the suffering. It transforms the suffering even into bliss. It overcomes the duality of masochism and so on. And that's why Kala Chakra is so amazing because Kala Chakra makes that, that's an inconceivable idea that you could look at someone in hell and see them as blissful. But by their, but having created such being so deeply confused, they had, and having such powerful energy of life force still within themselves, they were able to hold themselves on a point of a needle so that their whole life was reduced to just feeling the pain of being pierced or cut or boiled or frozen, which is a testament to the power of their life force, which itself is bliss. <laughs> so the needle point is made of bliss and their nerve ending is made of bliss. And yet they're holding that just there. It's this extremist masochism of the psychotic, alienated hell, hell being, the naraka. Actually, they don't have a word for a hellion or someone who's trapped in hell. There's no word for that. When they refer to a person, they just say naraka. They use the word for hell. That's interesting. I never know. That might be the reason why. They don't want to depress you by saying the person in hell. So, you know, you have like expression like the human, the person on earth, you know, or the divine in a certain search, the Brahma bodied God, you know. But you, the hell thing, there's no, there's no sort of person suffix to go with hell, naraka. It's just naraka admi. You, you have to add the word for a person. Yeah, but you don't, you just say the naraka. Hell. So that's interesting. Like no one's really in hell. I mean, no one is left out. But oh yeah, but then Kala, and Kala Chakra especially because Kala Chakra shows the Buddha as a body made of time. So that means your positive future is in your present. And then her, she has no atoms. And they don't even say, they don't actually say he has no atoms, but he probably has no atoms, I guess. But she has a body without atoms. So she's just pure flowing energy. Kind of, uh, it doesn't need solidity in some way. I don't know what that quite means. No, but anyway, it's a vision by being made of time into your body that you're everywhere in time. So it gives you a, a stepping stone for the person to say, okay, He's not ignoring that I'm suffering now out of my confusion, but he's aware simultaneously that I will in the future be a Buddha. And it, 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 it relieves you from the intolerable paradox of, actually, I'm already a Buddha, he, in his view. And I don't think so. That's the essence of Zen, by the way, of Soto Zen, anyway. Zhao Dung Zen, Chan, which is that you're supposed to, by just sitting there, you are Buddha. And the Roshi is supposed to see you as a Buddha. And your side of yourself as not a Buddha is what clashes into the higher side of the Roshi. And that's the, that's the ultimate nature of all of the koans, is that holding your mind in that horrendous paradox between faith and despair, 
where they're kind of head to head in a, in a nuclear explosion, an efficient explosion, fusion explosion. And that's why Zen involves reason. It won't be an explosion if reason is not holding those two opposites, having reached a point where they're each held with full force. And then, and then the Zen, the, the, the one-pointedness is to be in the freedom without not holding either one. The power of the freedom is by being able to hold both totally. Amazing. Because, and that frees the being from, because that frees your deeper intuition from trapping your non-dual nirvana being in some conceptual division where I'm not really that, and it's not really me, and it's not really here, and it's not really there, and so on. And that's why in the famous four steps of feeling the confidence of a Buddha, they have an expression in colloquial Tibetan in the writings of some of them, but it's sort of codified a little bit in the writings of the masters. I don't see anything. Well, what I see is, what do I see? Nothing. What do I know? Freedom, emptiness. What do I feel? Bliss. What am I? Clear light. So the what am I? Clear light. The, the positive thing is a statement. It's, it's a mantra. It's really something. Tatva mazi. Therefore, in the Vimalakirti Sutra, there's a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing in the Vimalakirti Sutra, where the 32 bodhisattvas, including Manjushri, give statements very deep about non-duality. Some are nirvana or two, but actually when you realize there are not two, then you, have, you enter the doorway of non-duality, so on. You know, good and evil are two, but when you're in the not two, then you're the door, and the other, etc. But when they're not two, they're, they're all good, is, is of course, that's, that's what it is. But that final point is a statement. It's a mantra. Amazing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But in that case, then, then, Manjushri tells the other 31 bodhisattvas, I think, other 31, he tells them, you guys all said, I think, unfortunately, they mostly died. They are, you, all that you said was good. Problem is, you said something. So there was a little problem with it that made it not that good, not perfect. So now, Vimalakirti, what do you say? And so then Bhimalakirti didn't speak. <laughs> and then 84,000 spirit beings who were present in that assembly in, in Bhimalakirti's house, they all attained some stage of, higher stage of enlightenment, sort of close to, relating to where they started from, you know, where they were, to some higher degree. It was completely liberating, that, that silence. Even though earlier in the sutra there was another silence that was totally unliberating. So, I, I used to have students write a paper. So anyway, okay. So, no one is left out and it becomes totally natural for you to want everyone else to know their own reality. You can even see how they inevitably will do so, given infinite time to eventually overcome their misknowing, given the infinite numbers of beings who have already become Buddhas and only wish them to do so, and given that these Buddhas have the power and the artfulness to effectively help them to do so. So this is my consolation prize. I am not that happy and satisfied and blissful now. <laughs> but my sense of being 
isolated in a now moment cannot withstand analysis. I have no good reason to not believe I am engaged in endless continuity. And I have good reason to believe the Buddha, because he knew and taught the emptiness and, and relativity that I can experimentally and experientially verify. So I can be profoundly certain that I will also become such a Buddha, experience such a nirvana, and join the Buddha and Bodhisattva's team to effortlessly bring other beings into their own blissful awareness of being in that beginningless flow of bliss and love. This is my consolation. This very moment here and now will be known later by me as already experienced here and now, here and now, as bliss void indivisible, super bliss freedom inseparable, totally indivisible universal communion of all individuals retroactively, so that I will be here now. <laughs> Although there's no here and no now and no be, but I will be here now, retroactively. Not only this moment here and now, fleeting as it is, but all the infinite past moments of all the experiences of all my existences and all those of all my fellow beings will be revised in the light of every single one. Yours at one's apostrophe S, yours as well as mine, nirvanic freedom, and will be thoroughly known as pure bliss, not only forever after, but forever before. <laughs> the past also will be transformed and all tragedies rectified and immersed in blissful happiness. This is the consolation prize I have awarded myself, and I'm utterly delighted to share it with you. This is why I'm happy to share that Buddhas have more fun. This was my original title. You might think that once you are immersed in super bliss, it's boring. That the nature of fun is its quality of contrast with boredom. That pleasure must come from its quality of being relieved from pain. If there is no pain, there cannot be pleasure. So no fun for Buddhas, only boredom. But this is yet another mistake. The point is that Buddhas are not alone. No one is ever alone. So why should Buddhas be? There are other Buddhas, lots of them, countless numbers. And there are those who do not know that they can be Buddhas. You have become a Buddha yourself through your being blown away in super bliss. No more pain for you. So you have no more interest in your own condition. You have completely gotten over yourself, to use the, the subtitle of my dear friend Mark Epstein. How to get over yourself. It was called Advice Not Given, How to Get Over Yourself. Yes, you are bored, but only with yourself. Your awareness of others has become unlimited. And for you, they are the most interesting parts of your infinite self. And your super bliss energy is like a great wave that lifts them out of their pains. You just have to carefully monitor it not to swamp them. Your fun, therefore, is their fun, their relief from all pains. And there are always more of them, since they are numberless in the infinite relativity of which you have also become blissfully aware. So as a Buddha, you have more fun than you ever did have, ever could have all alone with the inexhaustible bliss energy of your love for ever more others, whose immersion in happiness becomes your endless fun. I should say exponential endless fun. So, aha! Ah la la! Buddhas do have more fun. La la ho! Settled. Ah e ah! And sealed. Ara li ho! Those are some ecstatic things in some Siddha poem. And they each are called different Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, unity of them all, etc. They all sort of connect to different sounds. So the French have really got something cool going with their ooh la la, you know. Oh la la. <laughs> ah, la, la. May you feel relieved and blessed by this fact just as much or merely 
or surely even more than I am. And may such a bliss be felt as soon as humanly possible in our indestructible Buddha verse that we all together enjoy and share with each other in wisdom, bliss, and love. Ha! I love that. I think that's great. That's my consolation. By the merit of getting through this teaching, reading, and commenting on wisdom is bliss, meaning Buddhas have more fun, the four friendly fun facts that can change your life, fitted into the pattern of the four friendly fun facts that can change your life. By the merit of that, may I quickly, soon, super soon, become a perfect Buddha to be able to help every other being become equal to that Buddhahood myself. <laughs>